Welcome back to Critical Thinking. This series of videos is about fallacies or arguments that fail to prove their conclusion effectively. This third video is about formal fallacies. Those are arguments that are problematic because of their logical form. So these are arguments that can be defined as deductively invalid based purely on their form. And that's unlike the informal fallacies that are defined at least in part based on their content. To illustrate the ease with which um, it's possible to commit formal fallacies without thinking about it, we're gonna use this Wasson selection task. This is used by cognitive psychologists to evaluate people's ability to reason logically. And if you make a mistake on this task, it illustrates the two uh, formal fallacies we're gonna discuss in this video. Now there's many uh, formal fallacies you can make more than just two. We're gonna cover two ones that are very common that are similar in form to modus ponens and modus tollens, two of the valid argument forms, but they're just different enough to make them fallacies. So let's look at this Wasson selection task. This is just an example of the task. There's different versions, but they all have the same general structure. So this is a series of cards that we're given. We can see one side of four cards. Um, and then we're told this proposition is true. If a card shows an even number on one face, then its opposite face is blue. Even though we're told that proposition is true or we're being presented with that proposition, we're not actually sure that it's true. We wanna test that proposition to see if it's actually true. So the task is this, which card or cards must you turn over in order to test the truth of that proposition? Um, and in order to figure this out, you have to use some deductive reasoning. So let's go through each of the cards one by one, left to right, and figure out if we need to turn over that card to test the truth of this proposition. Let's start with the card that has a five on it. So do we need to turn this card over to see what's on the other side in order to test the truth of this proposition? The answer is no. So you might be surprised by this, but the proposition does not say anything about odd numbered cards specifically. The proposition is actually about even numbered cards. It says if a card shows an even number on one face, then its opposite face is blue. The card does not say that if, um, sorry, the proposition does not say if the card has an odd number, then its opposite face will not be blue. That would be a different proposition that's not logically equivalent to it. So now let's look at the second card, which is an even numbered card. It has an eight on it. Do we need to turn this card over to test the truth of the proposition? The answer is yes, we have to, because suppose we flip the card over and it has a green side or a red side or some other color or even something else that's not a color that would falsify the proposition. The proposition says if there's an even number on one face, the other face will be blue. So if we turn it over and the other face is not blue, that would falsify the proposition. So we do need to flip over that card. Now, let's look at the blue card on the right. Do we need to flip that card over to determine the truth of the proposition? The answer is no, and you might be surprised by this, but the reason why is because you could think of this proposition as saying that all even numbered cards have blue on their other side. It does not say that all blue cards have an even number on the other side. It does not say that if a card has a blue face, then its opposite face has an even number. That's a different proposition logically. It's very common to confuse these. These are called logical converses of each other. So the converse of if P then Q is if Q then P. The converse of if a card shows an even number on one face, then its opposite face is blue is if a card has a, a blue face, then its opposite face is even. Those are two different propositions. They're not equivalent. And so that's why we do not have to flip over this card. Now let's look at the green card on the far right. Do we have to flip that card over to test the truth of this proposition? The answer is yes, which also might surprise you. The proposition does not mention green on any of its um, clauses, either the antecedent or the consequent. However, if we flip this card over and it has an even number, that falsifies the proposition because if it's an even numbered card, it's supposed to have a blue face on the other side. So we do have to flip this card over just to make sure it does not actually have an even number. And this task, um, it may seem simple, but it's actually surprisingly difficult. I've read that even some people who are logic professors or are trained in logic 
get some of the questions wrong when they're being tested in this way. So now we're going to give an example of a formal fallacy called affirming the consequent. Affirming the consequent has the following logical form. If P, then Q, Q, therefore P. It looks very similar to the valid argument modus ponens, but modus ponens would be if P, then Q, P, therefore Q. This reverses the order. The other um, premise affirms the consequent of the conditional, the then clause, instead of affirming the antecedent, the if clause. You can think of modus ponens as affirming the antecedent, that is valid. Mod uh, affirming the consequent is invalid because the other premise is the consequent of the conditional. So in order to illustrate this, I'm going to give you an example that appeals to human social rules or customs. And it turns out that people are much better reasoning about violating or conforming to social rules than they are about more abstract cases involving cards, numbers, colors, etc. So if you gave people examples about social uh, contexts, they tend to reason much more effectively than about non-social contexts. And this could be a partial clue as to how human reasoning evolved, in fact. But let's look at the example. If a person is a washed out actor in his 50s, then he is legally permitted to drink alcohol. So I'm illustrating this idea with Bojack Horseman, who is indeed a washed out actor in his 50s. Amelia Clark is legally permitted to drink alcohol. Therefore, Amelia Clark is a washed out actor in his 50s. We can see that there's a problem because we know the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. So that means the argument form must be invalid. Now let's take a look at another example that illustrates this fallacy, but this is one that we're going to illustrate with the Wasson selection task. If a card shows an even number on one face, then its opposite face is blue. This card's face is blue. Therefore, the card shows an even number on its opposite face. If you thought we had to turn over the blue card in order to test whether it had an even number on its other side, you were committing the same fallacy. But notice how much more difficult it is to tell this is a bad argument than in the previous example. It seems to be because human psychology is better at reasoning correctly in the context of social rules and whether people are abiding by them rather than other contexts. And so it may be that our reasoning ability evolved or developed, whether biologically or culturally, in order to um, try to reason about social rule breaking rather than about other types of things per se. Even though we can also apply it to other contexts, it doesn't come as easily for us. A second type of formal fallacy is called denying the antecedent. The logical form of this is if P then Q, not P, therefore not Q. It's similar to modus tollens, but in modus tollens you're denying the consequent. If P then Q, not Q, therefore not P, and that is valid. But if you deny the antecedent instead, it becomes invalid. Let's look at an example. If a person is a washed out actor in his 50s, then he is legally permitted to drink alcohol. Amelia Clark is not a washed out actor in his 50s. Therefore, Emily Clark is not legally permitted to drink alcohol. We know there's a problem because the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. That's enough to prove that this whole argument form is invalid. Now let's take a look at another example, this one from the Watson selection task context. If a card shows an even number on one face, then its opposite face is blue. This card does not show an even number on its face. Therefore, its opposite face is not blue. If you thought we had to flip over the five, in order to see if it had a blue face on the other side, you were committing this fallacy. So you can see how much easier it is to commit the fallacy in a non-social rule context. And so there are many more formal fallacies. Um, these are just two very common ones. That's why the textbook focused on those. But keep in mind that even though the fallacies are very simple to understand, psychologically they can be easy to slip into. So whenever you see an argument that has this general structure, one premise is an if then, the other affirms or denies either the antecedent or consequent. Check very carefully to see if it's one of the valid forms, modus ponens or modus tollens, or one of the invalid forms, affirming the consequent or denying the antecedent.